بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على المرعوف رحمة للعالمين وعلى آله وصحبه ومن استمن بسنته إلى يوم الدين وبعد قال الله عز وجل في كتابه العزيز وفرقان الحميد بعد عوض بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم ونفس وما سواها فألهمها فجورها وتقواها قد أفلح من زكاها وقد خاب من دساها صدق الله العليم العظيم <coughs> Honorable brethren and respected sister in Islam, whenever we come to Jum'ah, whenever we hear a spiritual discourse somewhere else, whenever we hear talks about Allah, whenever we hear talks about religion in general, if we're actually listening, if we're actually trying to internalize, if we're actually trying to benefit from them, we do. But why is there not a revolutionary change manifesting itself? Why are we not changing in general as people, as human beings? What's the problem? What's the contention? There's so many lectures being given, there's so many discourses taking place, there's so many programs that masjids are doing, scholars are doing, guys are doing, preachers in general, no matter what caliber they're of, are doing and trying. Why is there no change coming about in our personalities? I mean, we talked about communal change from various angles many, on many instances in the khutbahs before. But in terms of our individual personas, like why is it that I'm still the same person that I am today, maybe a little worse than I was yesterday? Why am I not constantly thriving, spiritually speaking? Thriving spiritually, what's what's the issue? Because a lot of times when we hear these khutbas, when we hear the verses of the Quran being recited with the meaning or without, whenever we feel spiritually uplifted, then we're ga galvanized for that moment. They leave us spiritually invigorated for the moment. And that's the problem. It's for the moment. And why is it for the moment? Is it our fault? Is it the speaker's fault because you didn't do a good job of hyping it up or motivating you and, and making the message more evident and clear? Not necessarily. The problem is because ourselves, when we actually try and we try to look for a way to figure out how to implement what we learn, our self, our inner self, our nafs thrusts and dignity at us. And it tells us, you know what, there's so much that you need to do and you don't know where to start from, so let's just either not do it or procrastinate till tomorrow, till we figure it out. And sometimes we hear so many stories about, you know, how the Prophet Wasallam struggled, how the Sahaba struggled, how the people of the past, I mean the past who were pious struggled for the cause of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, for the cause of his religion. And when we hear about how they struggled, we're like, hey, that's too much struggle. I don't think I can manage. I think that's too much for me. I think there is no point in even beginning anywhere because I just don't think I can do it. And when this ambiguity swirls around our head and we don't know where to start from, then we just end up giving up. We end up giving up until the next chutbah. The next chutbah comes along, we feel fascinated again, we feel spiritually uplifted again, and subhanAllah, the desire comes up again, but then the moment reality hits and life hits, we're like, ah, oh, this is too much. The fix to this problem lies in us identifying who we are as people, what works for us, knowing our own personalities, becoming a master of ourselves, of how we function. And how do we do that? By starting off by not playing with ourselves, by not joking with ourselves. When we set goals for ourselves, set realistic goals. When we look for things to follow, look, look for realistic things to follow and then follow them. And when we make tawbah to Allah from certain things, make real tawbah. Real tawbah meaning, I will never do this again. A lot of times when we make tawbah to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and our dua to Allah, I won't do this again. It's filled with so many clauses. 
like, like we're writing a, a contract or something that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, this, these are, this is my thought, but then we, we, we word it in such a way where there's so many, so many loopholes. Or so many loopholes that, you know, um, I'm probably going to end up doing it again, but you know what, you're forgiven, so go ahead and forgive me for this time, and then inshallah, um, the next time comes, then I'll ask for forgiveness again. And, you know, our, subconsciously, even if we don't say these things, subconsciously, that's what's in the back of our mind. Right? When we even make Tawbah to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So anytime we're trying to transform any aspect of our life, there's always something that, that is kind of holding us back that we use to hold us back. And that is our fear of changing. That is our fear of stepping out of our complacency that we don't think we want to change. We're happy with the way life is going right now. It's very silky smooth. Let it, let it be like that. When we have to understand that we, once we identify our personality and what works with us, that is that that is the first step. That's the first step in actually making about change. Like there's actually a, a statement, which which is very direct in its connotation, which goes man alfa nifsa alfa alfa. That individual who identifies themselves has identified Allah subhanahu wa taala. Meaning, know what works for you. Know how you get motivated to do something. Try to figure out what things make me actually do stuff and what things hold me back. And once you know how you work, then inshallah Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will aid you. He will literally hold your hand and, I mean, metaphorically speaking, hold your hand and walk you to Jannah. And like literally treat you like like a servant who is actually sincerely looking for guidance. And once you are, once you become that, then you're just like the Sahaba of Allah Muhammad. The Sahaba of Allah Muhammad, if you look for precedent, right, in terms of following one of them, or, or a few of them, you will look for all, you will, you will find all kinds of personalities. All kinds of personalities. They weren't only one kind of personality where it was always Jahannam, 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 or harshness, harshness, harshness. You will find those who are a little bit softer, jenna, jenna, jenna. But then you'll find those of them who are, you know, sometimes jenna, sometimes jenna. You will find all kinds of personalities. If you're a poor person, you'll find full poor sahaba that you can follow. If you're a wealthy individual, you'll find precedent for that too. You'll find wealthy sahaba. If you're a very strong personality, you'll find people like Abu bin Khattab. If you're a very soft personality, you'll find people like Abu Bakr al Whatever personality you are, if you look for precedent in their life, you will find it. Which is why when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala states, when the Dina Jahadu Fina, the Nahdiannahum Subudan. When those who struggle in our path, we will guide them to in our in our way for us. Those who struggle for us. Meaning those who are sincerely looking for guidance, we will guide them to our paths. Generally speaking, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala only talks about one path when he talks about his path. Like for example, the, the, the path of Shaytan, Allah always says multiple. Multiple, because Shaitan will always look for different avenues to, to, to mess your life up. To really just cause you doom and destruction. Shaitan will come at you from various angles, from multi various dimensions, and Shaitan will always keep coming, which is why it's super to Shaitan. It's always the pathways of Shaitan, but it's always a deal slow on the thing. Allah guide us to the straight path. Sabiyyida, Sabiyyida, the way of Allah. But over here, there's only one context in where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says there are multiple paths of getting to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Right? And that is those who struggle. Allah will give them a different journey. Every person has a life story of their own. Everybody has a journey of their own. Everybody can find Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala on account of, of how they work. Everybody has a different uh, a different story of, of, of how they found Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Like, Abu Bakr radiallahu anhu, it was very simple. The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, all he had to do was tell him, and he's like, okay. Now, even when people objected, the people are sitting around the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, when he came back from his cell in Miraj, and he was telling them of all the miraculous events that had transpired, everybody, some of them shook their head, some of them were astonished, so they started clapping sarcastically, some of them were just like, oh my god, like this person lost his mind. Some of them were like, okay, Abu Bakr is passing by right now, let's ask him. Even his own friend will say, this guy is, he's not in his right senses right now. Abu Bakr will be long one who passed by, 
And they asked him, you know, a person is telling you that they went up to the sky on this magical animal, and they went up, and they, they went to heaven, they went to hell, they spoke to God, and they saw, they went, they, they, they did all of these things, and their bed is still warm when they, when they came back. Meaning, like, they didn't even spend that much time up there, and they accomplished so many feats. Abu Bakr al-Ilamu, his answer right away was, it depends on who said it. And he said that, okay, yeah, of course, it's your friend. Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, that he was told, he accepted right away. Umar bin Khattab radiallahu anhu, it wasn't that simple, right? And that's kind of what I want to focus on, because that man's change was drastic. Abu Bakr radiallahu anhu was always a noble person. But Umar radiallahu anhu went from, you know, being one of the harshest and staunchest enemies of Islam to being one of the biggest uh, reasons or, 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 or causes through which Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala spread Islam. Right? And Umar radiallahu's drastic change is something that we can all benefit from because some some of us don't even probably don't probably don't even have to make drastic adjustments. Some of us probably just need to fix up a few things here and there, and our inshallah our life will be very, very smooth, religiously speaking. We don't need to alter that much. But we, because we're already Muslim to begin with, we already have the first part of it. Umar radiallahu whose drastic change was being one of the staunchest non-Muslims to being one of the best Muslims ever. To an extent where the Prophet said, every single time he would say something, I believe in this, and Abu Bakr and Umar believe in this. Right? The Prophet mentions so many feats about Umar ibn Khattab. He says if there was a prophet after him, it would be Umar ibn Khattab. So this man's change was really, really drastic, and he went from being somebody who really wanted to, one time even assassinate the Prophet to becoming somebody who, who couldn't even stand not seeing the Prophet. Who couldn't even deal with the news of the Prophet's son's demise? That's that's how much he loved him afterwards. So where did it all start from? How did it happen? His desire to change, his desire to look for the truth was sincere. That was his first step. It was sincere. It wasn't haphazard. It wasn't like you know what yeah, the truth. Not really. If it goes along with my whims and fancies, I'll, I'll follow. If not, then no. His his desire to change was real. And that's why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala guided him to the straight path. Where he really disbelieved in the message of the Prophet sallallahu That's why he disbelieved. He didn't disbelieve in the message of the Prophet sallallahu because of stubbornness. He really believed idolatry was foolish even from the get-go. Right? Well, like one time when he was traveling and he, he forgot to take his idol, Umar bin Khattab radiallahu because they would travel with their idols. Whenever they wanted to pray, pull the idol out, put it right in front of them and pray. Amr al Ghulamah one time forgot to bring his idol with him and he wanted to pray during his journey. He's like, oh man, I forgot my God at home. So what can I do now? Amr al Ghulamah who said, all right, I've got some dates. So he took out the dates, kind of like made like Play-Doh out of the dates and like made an idol for him to worship. And after he did that, then like he put it away and he realized, oh my God, he's getting hungry. This is, all my food is here, my God is at home, but this is my God now, but I'm kind of hungry now. So I'm going to be a lot more relating his own stories, like I ate, I ended up eating my God, <laughs> right? So, and then later on, when he was narrating his story, he was saying that I already started seeing, seeing how foolish this was, because he was in pursuit of the truth. He was really in pursuit of the truth, right? And that's why sometimes he would pass by the Prophet Salah, he sent him before he when he was reading the Quran, and he would be like, you know what? Just like everybody else is saying, he's probably just uh, a poet who has a very eloquent and sweet tongue. And then in the Prophet the next verse, because he was sincerely looking for the truth, was, This is not the statement of a poet. But he done that we knew very little to believe. And I was like, oh my god, okay. Then, just like everybody else is saying, it must be the saying of a fortune teller because this guy just thought that I would, I mean, this guy just recited or he spelled out my thoughts. So he's probably a fortune teller. He knows what's going on in my head. And then, very next ayah, because he was looking for the truth, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala made it such that it was, وَمَا هُوَ بِقَوْلِ دَانِمْ قَلِيلُمْ لَا تَلَكَّهُونَ Verily, this isn't the statement of a fortune teller. Very little do you take heed and see them the open eye This is nothing but revelation from the Lord of the worlds. When this, all of these seeds were being planted in his heart because he was genuinely looking for the truth. Even when it came to, you know, acceptance time, Umar had a very rough upbringing. 
He's a child of Khattab. His father, as, as strict as we, we think almost Allah Muhammad, his father was his father. You know what I'm saying? He was much more stricter. He was like that because of his father, Khattab. They were very rough upbringing, so he was used to getting it the rough way every single time. So, like, with everybody else, the Prophet was soft, he was very, uh, you know, lenient in his approach, smiled, spoke eloquently, compassionately. With Umar, the Allah, even when he came to the Prophet and he knew, the Prophet knew that, inshallah, he's going to accept his son because he had made dua for him the previous night. But even then, the Prophet said, and then, like, oh, Umar, you don't accept his son, is it right? Wait, no. He grabbed him. He grabbed Umar bin Khattab, like, like this. And he said, Oh Allah, what are you waiting for? Accept Islam. This is what are you waiting for? Are you waiting for Allah's punishment to come down on you? Oh Allah. And Allah is not a small man. Prophet is doing this, by the way, shows his own strength. Allah be Allah is such a large man that if he ever sat on a donkey or, or an animal, his feet would touch the ground. Really big guy, really strong, muscular guy, Allah bin Khattab. So that's how the Prophet said him talk to him. Right? Whenever Allah bin Khattab will be Allah, even after he became Muslim, he was harsh on himself. He was harsh on himself because he knew that's what worked with him. Because he was genuinely trying to change. And he knew that only if I get a clear-cut answer will I ever accept something. Which is why even when it come, came to the prohibition of alcohol, Umar the Allah he kept going to the Prophet and telling the Prophet about, uh, you know, what is the ruling of Allah? Asking the Prophet what is the ruling of Allah pertaining to alcohol? When the Prophet would wait for revelation to come down, Allah the Allah who would make a genuine dua to Allah, Allahumma lillin lana fi khamri bayana shifa'in. O Allah, give us clear-cut recommendations, clear-cut rulings, legislations pertaining to, to, to wine, to alcohol. And then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala revealed one verse. And then the Umar bin Allah said that people are still, you know, kind of consuming, kind of partaking, kind of, you know, uh, enjoying, enjoying himself with alcohol, even though the prohibition was not clear cut, but still there was repugnant vibes about it in, in verses. Then Umar bin Allah said again, Oh Allah, give us a clear cut answer. If there was any of us, oh, let me say to Umar, it's fine. Let's just go ahead and drink sometimes. Oh, Umar bin Allah sincere. He knew that this is wrong, so he said, Oh Allah, give us clear cut instructions. I know this is wrong, and I don't want to do it, but I'm going to end up doing it if it's not halal. So then he asked Allah, oh Allah, you know how like, you know, a lot of us have, don't ask the, the questions you don't want to know the answers to? He didn't want to know the answer because he was involved in alcohol, but he was still so sincere that he was harsh enough to himself to ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for a clarification three times until finally Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Ya ayyuhal ladhina amin al khamru wal baysi wal ansar wal islam rijusun min amal shaytan fajtahibu Oh, you who believe wine and all the other things that were mentioned along with their gambling and all that, they are filled from most of the actions of Shaytan, so stay away from them now. Right? Allah kept concurring with, with the truth in every single verse that was revealed. You know, this man had an intuition because of his sincere desire to pursue the truth that every single time he actually thought of something, when he concocted something in his brain, his intuition to the truth was so solid and so strong that Allah would agree with him all the time. Even if he sometimes disagreed with the Prophet's law, even if he said his opinion was not concurring, like for instance, the DFWs of Badr, it was not concurring with the opinion of the Prophet's law, but Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala very, like, you know, uh, assertively, very you know, aggressively revealed verses in, in, in the favor of his opinion because it's pursued. But the truth was very sincere and he never beat around the bush. Allah bin Khattab was such a personality where the Prophet culminated his praise by saying, Verily, there were very, very many people before you who were muhaddath. Muhaddath is not a person who narrates hadith that's a muhaddath. Right? But Muhammad is a person who is inspired by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala without revelation. He just has an intuition. A truth naturally flows on their tongue because he was a truthful person, an honest person who did not beat around the bush and did not constantly pat himself on the back. He did not constantly pat himself on the back and that was one of the main reasons why his drastic change from becoming uh, I mean, from being once upon the greatest enemies of Islam to becoming one of the, the greatest supporters of Islam, that's why it was so drastic and that's why it was so efficient and that's why it was so truthful and so real, because it was genuine, right? But he still, he knew his personality was very rough, so he was rough on himself. 
Like sometimes he would go and put his hand over the fire and try and feel the fire a little bit and tell himself, oh, well, Allah, you can't even handle this. How are you going to handle the fire in Sometimes he would cry so much in his prayer that people couldn't even understand what he was reciting because that and shit that they look at, that's how harshly and intensely he was weeping. You know, people would be able to conveniently come up to him and criticize him in the middle of his lectures. Like somebody, and he, and he would be like, you're right. You know, sometimes, sometimes he'd be walking around the streets as the Khalifa, right off of, at the counter from one third of the known world at that time. And a woman would be able to come up to him and say that, Omar, I know a time when you were just a little Omeid. Omeid is uh, basically a nickname for, which makes the name almost smaller, right? Omar, Omeid. Uh, so it's, it's just like, you know what, you're a little boy, baby boy, right? I knew when you were that, just grazing sheep. And he, and he was like, yeah, that's true. And he would start crying. He was a harsh personality, but harsh to himself. But when it came to the believers, dealing with other people, he was soft. He was soft. Just like that, Abu Bakr al-Siddiq was a very soft individual when it came to his own personality. Little things inspired him. Little things made him do everything that he needed to do. He didn't need much, uh, you know, in terms of motivation and galvanization through sermons and lectures and no. All you need to do, all the Prophet needed to do was just indicate and Abu Bakr al would have it done. He didn't need much. But when it came to implementing the laws of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala because he knew his personality was soft, he was a little extra strong. Right? To a point where one time him and Umar who got into a little bit of a discussion in terms of how to um, deal with like a new branch of renegades that, that just came about and they refused to, um, to pay zakat. They're like, we want to become Muslims but we don't want to accept this branch of your faith of paying zakat. Umar said, just, you know, be soft towards them, Abu Bakr And Abu Bakr al-Allah, despite his soft personality, said, Oh, Umar, Ajabdaun fi jahiliya wa khawarun fi Islam. Are you going to be a very powerful, mighty, aggressive individual before Islam and a coward in Islam? I will go ahead and implement it, even if I have to give my life for it. Abu Bakr al-Allah knew, I'm a soft guy, but if I use my softness to implement it on other people, it would be walk all over. So if we look for different personalities, different precedents, why the Sahaba was such a, a successful group of people is because they knew who they were and they acted accordingly. They knew what worked with them and they accorded, uh, acted accordingly. But they could be a man of the Allah Ta'ala, who was somebody who feared hypocrisy so much, which is why the Prophet entrusted him with the list of the hypocrites. Because he feared it so much that, you know what, I, I, he, the Prophet said this man will never probably be amongst them. Because right? he actually fears it so much, he's paranoid of it so much. And that's why he needs to say that a lot of people would ask the Prophet about good things, about Jannah, about the rewards of the year after, but I always used to ask him for the bad things. Because I wanted to stay away from him. He knew his personality. I needed to know more about Jahannam. A lot of you, even all, a lot of you have different personalities. If I ask you what's your favorite verse in the Quran, or favorite surah in the Quran, I'll get different answers. Some of you will say Surah Al-Rahman because it reminds you of the mercy of Allah and the bounties of Allah and all of those things. And some of you will say um, Surah Munafiqun, uh, Surah Qaf, or, or like a surah which has pun like, you know, punishment elucidated in it. Right? Because that motivates you to stay away from these things. So we need to identify what kind of individual we are. What works for us. Look for precedent in the lifetime of the Prophet or the Sahaba of the Allah. Look for somebody who you can easily, you know, be like, hey, this guy's personality matches mine. You know, if I'm wealthy, this person is wealthy. How did he conduct himself? If I'm poor, this person was poor. How did he conduct himself? How can I work with that? How can I take his life and his model uh, uh, in terms of in terms of uh, qualities, in terms of uh, traits that he developed, not that he had, and how can I work with those and implement them with my, in my own life? And all of these things, once we learn to do that, and our sincerity in pursuit of the truth is something that Allah accepts. Allah will not leave us unguided. Allah subhanahu wa will definitely guide us to the straight path, and Allah subhanahu wa will definitely bring about change, and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala won't leave us in the dark. Allah will not leave us out, uh, you know, just just looking for guidance and just being lost and withered away from any form of <coughs> guidance whatsoever. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala give me and all of us the ability 
to learn from this. And obviously, I mean, although the majority of the discussion was focused on Umar bin Khattab, inshallah, we'll actually do a program about him. He's, he, read his seerah. Read his seerah, learn about his seerah, however you possibly can. It's one of the most fascinating seerahs ever. Umar his path of self reformation was something that we can all benefit from. It's universal. Even though he was a harsh man he, to himself and soft to other people, but it's something that we can all use and all benefit from. Like, like Aisha Allah says very beautifully, she says, إِذَا شِئْتُمْ أَنْ تَطِيبُ الْمَجْلِسِ فَبْدَأُوا بِذِكْرِ مِنْ خَطَاءٍ If you ever want to uh, illuminate or, or make your gathering more interesting, more fascinating, and more just filled with, with energetic vibes, then start talking about the child of Khattab, Amr Allah so, inshallah, let, let's all try to learn his life, try to take some benefit from whatever it is that he's done to better himself. And may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala give me and all of us the ability to actually have a sincere desire to uh, implement the truth and preach it to others and promote it to others. Well, I'm down with you.